Today, we step into the third sermon in the sermon series for such a time as this, Seven Lessons for Living Through Pandemic Times. We'll take a look at how each of our lives really matter. We will do this through the lens of the dreamer, Joseph, and the redeemer, Jesus. Both the redeemer and the dreamer saved lives through their vision of a better world and God's healing touch in their lives. This world needs dreamers and redeemers. So let's learn from them so that we can become more like them. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. It is challenging and can be death-defying to be a dreamer and a redeemer. If you don't believe me, ask Patrice Cullors or Alicia Garza or Opal Tometi or Anthony Fauci. Chances are you only know Dr. Fauci's name. He is the director of the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases and has been in that post since 1984. He is known and respected across the world as one of the top experts on pandemics and infectious diseases. People have studied under him from across the globe to address pandemics in their places, in their regions, in their lands. Now Patrice and Alicia and Opal are the founders of Black Lives Matter Network which is a global network established in 2013 to advocate and protest against racial discrimination. We know it as BLM. It's very decentralized by design. It truly is grassroots, but it calls for all people across the globe to stand together, to be strengthened by diversity, empathy, restorative justice, and intergenerationality. Their word, I love it. These three women and this one man have stood for truth and integrity and have stood face to face with hate groups online and hate groups in their faces and hate groups on the streets who have demanded from those that are trying to save lives that they say something else. As they stand there on our behalf, demanding that we save lives and create a world free of COVID-19 and anti-blackness. In listening to Dr. Fauci throughout this pandemic, I have been deeply moved by his consistent, unwavering focus on the virus and what we must do to flatten the curve of its spread. Washing hands regularly, social distancing, masks and facial coverings, widespread testing, contact tracing are all clear, measurable, achievable goals for each one of us to beat down COVID-19. Of course, we need a vaccine, we know that. However, if we follow what the expert, Dr. Fauci says, we would not now be where we are. If we had followed his words all along, we would not be the worst case nation in the world for the spread of this disease. From the president on down, we have heard confusing and frankly chaotic and distressing messages, bizarre excuses, conspiracy theories of truly inane origin, and militant resistance to proven scientific evidence based on transparent and clear and direct information. This has exacerbated and deepened a national economic crisis and the spread of COVID-19 in ways and places that it never need have happened. With 250,000 bikers from all around the country now in South Dakota for the weekend, we will see yet again, in a place that has barely been affected, the spiking and the spreading of coronavirus in new directions and devastating new ways. It's the largest gathering of people 
globally anywhere since this pandemic started. In a press conference last week, Governor Mike DeWine showed how one man worshiping with COVID-19 in a church here in Ohio spread the disease to at least 91 other people in the days that followed church. Folks, this is a clear example of why it is so dangerous to be together worshiping right now. If we all had listened to Dr. Fauci and followed the simple steps of hand washing, masking, social distancing, testing, and tracing, we might all be together in this beautiful cathedral of grace. That's what we would prefer. Anthony Fauci believes that your life matters, and so do I. And that is why we are continuing to do what we're doing, holding virtual services. Like all of you, I don't like it one bit. The staff of the church doesn't like it either. But each of us loves you and doesn't want you to die here. Your health and safety matter more to us than anything else. And that's why we continue this path. As for the most significant social movement of this generation, Black Lives Matter, it was the vision of three women to dig in their heels in the streets and to declare that the world should be free of anti-blackness. We need a world where every black person has the social, economic, and political power to thrive. In their efforts to combat racism, Patrice, Alicia, and Opal have drawn millions of other people across the globe into this movement. Their cause is my cause, and that cause is one that, are, that is held and treasured and held at the dearest and deepest point by so many now. We have to make it clear that racists need to become anti-racists. We have to make it crystal clear that black lives matter and set up structures of economic justice and social justice and political justice which makes these truths self-evident. There are a number of people who cry out, all lives matter in our times. And I believe that some who do this are genuinely wanting to say, let's just get along. Let's find a way that all of us can live in a better world. But I also believe that there are many who are not genuine in this response. They are seeking to silence the cries of those who have literally and figuratively felt the whip of discrimination for 401 years and more. Ayanna Lage says it this way, no one is saying that your life doesn't matter. What we are saying is this, that all lives can't matter until black lives matter. Sonia Renee Taylor, author and founder of The Body Is Not an Apology, likens it to your wife asking you if you think she's pretty and you responding, all people are pretty. <laughs> no. That will not go over well. I can guarantee you, I know from 35 years of experience, that's not the answer, right? What she needs in that moment is to hear you say that she matters. Not something vague and innocuous about all people being pretty. Do you see what I mean? Here's another way to put it. If someone cries out and points to a neighbor's house on fire, and the fire department comes and puts out the flames, Imagine you saying, well, what about my house? My house matters too. And the firefighter says to you, but your house is not on fire. And you say, but my house matters. It's important. Let's put out the fire first. That's what matters. So how do we make our lives matter? in these pandemic times. All of our lives matter. That's my question for today. How do we fight three, a three-front war, if you will, a viral war, a racist war, and now an economic war on all three fronts? 
what lessons can we learn from our text today that will guide us? Our texts today give us two great stories of two great men. Joseph, Jacob's son, and Jesus, Joseph's son. Not the same Joseph. Each is chosen by God at a pivotal point in their people's history to save their nation. Remember how we started this series with the story of Esther. Now we come to these two for another salvation story. Each is favored by a father and jealously judged by brothers and other men. One grows to greatness out of the strife of his family, the family of his father, the great patriarch of Canaan, and one grows to greatness out of the strife and conflict in the Roman Empire and the Jewish community of the first century Palestine. One is the interpreter of dreams, and the other is the fulfillment of dreams. But each is central as part of an epic story of Jewish and Christian scriptures. Each one makes his life matter. Genesis 37 begins as a story that will ultimately end the book of Genesis 13 chapters later. Joseph's story is so rich in color and imagery that it, reminds, that it remains one of the most vivid in Hebrew scriptures. Walter Brueggemann writes, the theology of this passage is hidden in that there are no moral conclusions placed before us. In fact, God is not even named in this passage. But those who read this story to the end will be impressed that things would have turned out much differently for Joseph and for Israel had it not been for the watchful care of the one who brought Israel into being. God is present, though not named. This narrative introduces us to Joseph and his half-brothers, who had a different mother. It is clear that Jacob favors Rachel and her son, Joseph. Through this favoritism, we're also introduced to harem intrigue, a common fact of life in the ancient Near East culture, as jealousy is passed on from mothers less favored to sons also less favored. Protected by his father, because of his youth and his favored status, the dreamer is an interpreter who has a coat of many colors. He is drawn out of his tent and into the desert by his half-brothers. Away from the shelter of his father's delight, Joseph is thrown into a waterless pit by his ten half-brothers. We don't hear anything about Benjamin. He's either not yet born or too young to show up there. The intention is to kill Joseph, but thanks to Reuben's intervention, Joseph's life is spared because most certainly death awaits him in this desert pit. He is sold to Ishmaelites. And I want us to pause here for a second. Okay, so you have Ishmael and Isaac, the sons of Jacob. Think about this. The son who was cast into the desert many, many weeks ago in the story that we followed, Ishmael, is it is his progeny who come along to save Isaac's progeny and actually continue this biblical story. It's a pa pa powerful and fascinating connection. Anyway, he's carried off to Egypt as a slave. There is another delicious irony in this for readers because we discover that by sparing Joseph's life, Jacob and the families of his 11 sons are ultimately spared later in Genesis by Joseph when their enslaved brothers become a powerful leader in Egypt. And that's not today's story. But it's important to know that this guy is not just busy saving his life, having the Ishmaelites grab his hand and pull him from the pit of despair to the safety of slavery, but he also saves in time the nation of Egypt, the nation of Israel, and his own family. Talk about a life that matters. Joseph's life really matters as he saves one family and two nations in one lifetime. Out of the pit and onto the water. Thousands of years later and a couple hundred miles away from the largest body of, on the largest body of fresh water in the land of Israel, another storm is brewing. Matthew's gospel takes us to the stormy sea of Galilee. There, the Son of God walks on water 
invites Peter to join him in water walking, catches Peter when he sinks into the water, teaches trust, teaches true faith, and then, as an extra, calms the sea. Amid the pressures of his transformational ministry, the story begins with Jesus just needing to get away from the crowd, and I would add the disciples, in order to pray. While the disciples go out on the boat and fish, that's what they do, they're fishermen, Jesus goes up on the mountain to pray. That's what he does, he's the Son of God. During the night, he is alone in prayer, and they end up fighting for their lives on the sea. As the morning dawns, he's walking across the water to the boat. The disciples, needless to say, are just a bit freaked out. They think it's a ghost. He offers assurance that it's in fact him, Jesus, not a ghost. And he tells them to not have any fear. Peter steps up and says, since it's you, command me to walk on the water with you. Peter knows that whatever Jesus commands will happen. So Jesus says, come. Out jumps Peter onto the water. He seems fine in his first few steps across the water. Remember, he's water walking too. But the wind blows up, and he sinks down, and he cries for Jesus to save him. Pulling his number one disciple out of the waves, Jesus proclaims, you of little faith, Why did you doubt? At this point, I want to pause to reflect on the meaning of judging Peter in these words. It's always sort of bothered me. Couldn't he just pulled him up and said, okay, back in the boat with you. I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer's classic analysis of Peter's response found in the book, The Cost of Discipleship. He writes, Peter had to leave the ship and risk his life on the sea in order to learn both his own weakness and the almighty power of his Lord. If Peter had not taken the risk, if he had not taken the step, he never would have learned the meaning of faith. The road to faith passes through obedience to the call of Jesus. Unless a definite step is demanded, the call vanishes into thin air. And if people imagine that they can follow Jesus without taking any steps, they are deluding themselves like fanatics. End of quote. Bonhoeffer goes on to draw the theological paradox that emerges from the scene. Only the one who believes is obedient, and only the one who is obedient believes. In other words, had Peter just stayed in the boat, and not taken that first step, his faith would have been worthless. But stepping out of the boat, Peter's faith is tried and true. None of us can follow Jesus without taking a step, without taking a step of faith, without being obedient to his call, come, follow me. When the wind picks up and Peter drops down, We need to remember that this is not the story of a skeptic who habitually doubts, but rather a faithful follower who becomes overwhelmed by circumstances surrounding him. We can all relate to this. We can all relate to this. Becoming overwhelmed when the sea gets too rough or when things get too hard, we all get overwhelmed. We're a lot like him. He begins to lose lose his nerve when the odds are stacked against him, trusting at that point in his Savior to save him. The steady, delivering hand of Jesus pulls Peter out of the water as Peter reaches up and grabs hold. To make your life matter, you have to raise your hand, like Joseph in the pit, reaching to his distant cousins, the Ishmaelites, to save his life and take him into slavery. It doesn't sound like a good plan, but he doesn't get out of the pit without reaching up his hand. 
If you don't reach out, if you don't reach up, if you don't take a risk, you will never learn the meaning of trust and the meaning of faith. The road to faith passes through obedience to the call of Jesus to follow. It passes through trust in God that when you reach out, the hand of God often seen in the angels of glory and the humans who surround you will reach back down and pull you up. You have to be able to say, my life matters. You have to believe that your life is valuable. You have to believe that you are here for a reason. You have to believe that you can make a difference. You have to believe. You have to also reach out and reach up to God in, in times when you need help. 2020, I think we can all admit, has been a dreadfully awful year in so many ways. Let's just put it out there. Yet, in this year, we have all seen amazing things happen too. We have seen new babies born into our families. We have seen our children ascend beyond the challenges of being taken out of school and being home all the time. We have seen our families, in many cases, grow closer together in the crises we have faced. And we have seen people come together to battle the virus and battle horrific racial and economic injustices. I have seen people reach out to one another and reach up to God in simple and magnificent ways. Could we do better? Always. We could have just kept walking on the water with Peter, but we sometimes lose our footing. But we are also finding ways to connect and trust. We're connecting with each other while we're apart. And I am blown away by your creativity, your ingenuity, and the vision of dreamers and redeemers all among us who seek to make us healthy and keep us well. Somehow or another, they keep pursuing the truth and faith. I am blown away by the little things people do to be kind to each other, to reach up, to reach out, when they're simply struggling themselves to get through every day. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. Each of your lives matters. To me, to God, no matter what you're up against, you are not alone. You are never alone. If you find yourself in a pit Reach up and reach out. Don't stay there by yourself. Others want you to be up on solid ground again. If you find yourself sinking in despair, reach out and reach up. If you find yourself filled with the Spirit of God and hopefulness and vision that no one can quite figure out how it came to you, but somehow or another you're changing people's lives because of it, keep bringing people back onto the boat. Keep reaching back and reaching out and reaching up. We will get through these times, and you may not believe that on this particular day, but follow these stories, and you will find hope in the days ahead. When you need something or someone, reach out and reach up. They're not far away. Lesson number three, make your life matter. I believe that you can and that you will and that you do. Amen.